So hey everyone, welcome to today's Protocol Labs research seminar. Today we are joined by Alexander Viand, who's both a doctoral student and a research assistant at ETH Zurich. Alexander works with secure computational technologies, including FHEs, or fully homomorphic encryptions, trying to make techniques more accessible to non-experts. Today, Alexander will be talking about HECO, automatic code optimizations for fully homomorphic encryptions. So Alexander, I will let you take it from here. Cool, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, hi, I'm Alex, and today I'm going to talk uh, a bit about our work on compiler designs for polymorphic encryption. And of course, as uh, is usual with most of this research, we uh, work with a lot of collaborators, including uh, some lovely students, Patrick Emilio at ATH, and also my supervisor, Amba, who is also here today. So uh, what is polymorphic encryption? So what is FHE? Um, FHE is, um, enables computation on encrypted data. Um, specifically, it allows us to delegate the processing of data to a third party without also having to give away access to the underlying data to that third party. And so that obviously has a huge potential to transform privacy as we know it today, because it will enable us to provide end-to-end end -to -end security for a much wider set of applications than what we can do today. And the good news is that thanks to a series of dramatic performance improvements, FHE is finally fast enough to be useful. And in fact, we're already starting to see it used in practice. For example, Microsoft has recently deployed uh, fully mobile encryption as part of the Microsoft Edge browser's password monitor service, which checks whether or not your credentials have been found in one of the lead databases that Microsoft knows about without you having to submit your credentials, nor them having to give you access to the lead databases they know about. Um, but we're also seeing uh, smaller startups uh, increasingly looking in how to, into how to commercialize FHE, uh, mostly around the area of privacy preserving machine learning, where you have a server that owns a machine learning model, and you as a client can send an encrypted input and get back an encrypted inference result on that model. While there is a lot of promise in FHE, um, there is one big caveat, and that is that Right now, developing FHE applications is notoriously hard. Um, it just isn't generally usable yet. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in trying to make things work. And so for the moment, we're mostly seeing things like this password monitoring service being developed by a whole team of cryptographic experts. But of course, if you want to see wider use of this technology, uh, then we must work on making it more accessible. And so today, I want to briefly touch on what exactly it is that makes developing FHE applications so hard, and then go into how compilers and tools like compilers can help to address these complexities. The reason why it is so complex to write FHE applications is that good performance tends to require fairly extreme optimizations. How we express our programs and how we optimize them is kind of crucial for good performance. The sort of trivial straightforward implementations in general will be exceedingly slow in the context of FHE. And even fairly small changes in the application can result in drastic differences in how um, you should implement it and then how well it will run, right? And so FHE imposes a lot of constraints on developers. And that in turn then results in a fairly unique programming paradigm for FHE. Uh, as an example, for example, uh, as an example, data independence um, is sort of built into FHE because, by definition, computations in FHE are a black box from which no information must leak, um, and that includes things like bits about whether or not we branched. And so, we cannot do data dependent branching. That means no jumping, no dynamic loops, and not even real if else statements. Uh, we actually can emulate things like if else statements by doing this multiplexing like thing that you can see here on the slide. But note that when we do that, um, we actually have to evaluate both sides of the branch, right? And so in general, data independent means that the runtime of your sort of secure computation is always at least the worst case runtime of the original algorithm. But in practice, it's frequently much, much worse even before you consider the actual overhead from doing the crypto and the math. 
Obviously, that's uh, maybe not the greatest news, but there is good news as well in the world of FAG. For example, a lot of the um, major FAG schemes right now offer a very powerful but restricted form of data parallelism. Um, so you can encode many thousands of integers into a single ciphertext rather than just a single one, and then operate on them in a single instruction, multiple data um, fashion. Uh, that can obviously give you massive amounts of speed up. But the catch is that you're very limited in terms of data movement. Uh, so you cannot sort of treat this like an AVX type 12 vector interaction. It's much, much more restricted. And so using this in order to enable actual uh, improvements in the latency of applications, rather than just sort of paralyzing and improving throughput, is actually a fairly, uh, a fairly significant challenge. But it's worth tackling this challenge because doing so tends to give you uh, several orders of magnitude in speed up. So it's not unusual to see uh, 10x, 100x, or even higher amounts of speed up from applying SIMD parallelism to a problem. And of course, I'm only touching on a few highlights here. In general, the FHG design space is relatively complex. For example, most of the schemes only natively support additions and multiplications. And while that obviously allows you to compute any polynomial function of the integers, that isn't necessarily the kind of things you want to compute. And so you can use polynomial approximation to sort of get around that. But it turns out that in practice, with the restrictions of FHG, it's very hard to find a balance between the accuracy in your um, polynomial approximation and the performance of that uh, approximation. And so, uh, alternatively, if you need non-polynomial evaluation, uh, you can look to emulating binary circuits, right? So you can, if you imagine addition and multiplication in Z2, well, that's just uh, or and uh, sorry, x or and and. And so, with that, you can do arbitrary computation. But the catch is that now every single operation in your input program is getting turned into dozens, if not hundreds, of actual FPG operations. Um, that compose these, let's say, binary adders, binary multiplier circuits that you are now having to emulate. So at the very least, when you're using this approach, you're seeing about an order of magnitude slowdown compared to doing things uh, directly over integers. And in practice, it tends to be much worse, actually, uh, because of sort of compounding factors. If that wasn't enough, then you also pretty much always, in both of these settings, have to consider things like parameter selection. This requires balancing security, performance, and accuracy. And so it's not just the thing of looking up the standard. It's really, per application, you need to figure out what are the correct parameters for this specific task. And um, you also have to deal with this very unique cost model of FHC. It's somewhat like MPC. Uh, in that additions are much cheaper than multiplications. But in fact, in FHG, most of the runtimes are dominated by these scheme-specific operations that don't actually modify the like, message on an application level logic, but they're just required to maintain the ciphertext as the computation uh, goes on. And so this is also something that you just have to wrap your head around. In summary, developing FHG applications is hard, because it requires looking beyond the overhead of the underlying FHG operations. And really, the application design has a significant impact on the performance. And so you need to spend a lot of time on that. As a result of that, we see a massive performance gap between sort of naive implementations done by non-experts and first-time users and those that were carefully designed and fine-tuned by experts with you know, maybe a PhD or even a faculty position in, in this field. Um, and so, um, you know, the design space obviously is very complex. There's a variety of different approaches, and they all have non obvious trade offs. So, that even for experts, it's not even entirely clear what would be the best approach for every problem. But for non experts, it's usually completely intransparent where to even begin with your implementation. As I said, I want to keep it fairly brief on the challenges today because we actually have a paper about this from last year where we go into a lot of the detail, a lot more detail about the challenges and what it means for sort of everyday developers. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can either check out the paper I linked below, or we also have a talk um, about this recorded or that's available on FHE.org uh, in the list of previous talks there. So yeah, but today I don't want to focus on that. And instead, I really want to focus this talk on asking how can compilers help in addressing these complexities? And that basically means asking ourselves, how can we make FHE accessible to non-experts? 
And we propose that that requires combining concepts from the crypto side on the other one hand, and then programming language design in order to be able to bridge that gap and to develop tools and abstractions that facilitate FHE development. And I personally happen to believe that compilers are the key to democratizing FHE um, because delivering on the promise of FHE requires tools that allows non-experts to actually develop, you know, turn the existing code into efficient FHE solutions with ideally minimal changes. Um, and in that world, the compiler should be taking care of most of the complexity, allowing the developers to express their computation tasks that they have in a high level language and then the compiler automatically generates and optimizes secure and efficient FHA code from that. And towards this vision, we have focused primarily on two challenges in our research. The first one is automatic translations. Specifically, we're focusing on mapping high-level imperative code, which doesn't really mesh well with the programming paradigm of FHA. And how do we map that to efficient batch FHE solutions automatically without requiring user input? Well, minimal user input, for example, we do require the user to annotate uh, which value is the secret. Okay. Um, on the other hand, we also with this bringing in a new architecture for FHE compilers that we believe much better reflects the different optimization opportunities that the FHE stack allows for. And so I want to have a closer look at what we actually mean by an end-to-end -end development tool chain for FHE. Traditionally, we might think of an FHE compiler, and this was definitely true, let's say, two, three years ago, as a tool that converts a program in some more or less high-level language into an arithmetic circuit. And the arithmetic circuit is sort of the, the natural and traditional mathematical model of an FHE computation. Um, if you then want to have an optimizing compiler, well, that means probably rewrites and simplifications on the circuit happening before you output it running. But in reality, we see that, you know, FHE applications come from a whole range of domains, which all have different paradigms used to express the programs. And so um, when we directly translate these various high level paradigms into circuits, what happens is that we lose a significant amount of information. Uh, and making it much, much harder to actually work with and optimize the program. And so one of the first things we do is we propose to extend the notion of an FHG compiler sort of outwards towards the front end by introducing program optimizations that make use of the high level information that is present in that input program while it's still a program and not a circuit. And on the other end of the system, we acknowledge that Really, what the end user wants is not an arithmetic circuit. What they want is um, instead a secure and efficient FHE implementation, right? And so that can mean uh, having executable that works on CPU, but also increasingly GPUs, uh, FPGAs, we've seen work for that in FHE. And then um, in the, looking towards the future, uh, FHE specific ASIC accelerators that are currently being developed as part of the DARPA DeepRack program by a couple of competitors, including, for example, Intel. So in order to support all of this, we also need to extend the compiler on the other side, um, so to the right here, with the ability um, to target hardware, first by lowering FHG operations to the underlying MAN, and then going further and scheduling these low-level operations appropriately for the target hardware. Okay, so that is sort of the zoomed out view of what we think an end-to-end -end FHE development tool chain needs to be. So how do we actually go about building such a compiler? Um, and for that, I want to take a very brief look at the evolution of compiler architectures. So the traditional compiler is this monolithic tool that takes in, let's say, C or C++, and then through a number of transformation, crunches it down into assembly for a specific target. And this is basically the architecture of GCC. But we soon realized that there are significant advantages to introducing additional intermediate representations, like the LLVM IR that is used um, to enable the client compiler to retarget to a variety of different backends from, a, from the same starting point. And this means that each of the translation steps that they now have to do is significantly smaller than the sort of large gap that something like GCC has to cross. But it turns out that for like high level language, especially higher level languages than C, C++, um, this is still a pretty large gap. 
And so we see compilers for Swift, for example, introduce their own high level intermediate representations that then lower, for example, to LLVM. And we're seeing this trend towards an increasing number of abstraction levels. For example, uh, with Rust, we're now seeing a high level and a medium level intermediate representation before they're targeting LLVM. And this trend really goes um, to its conclusion, sorry, uh, with domain specific languages. So with domain specific languages, where we have a large number of intermediate representations, and that means that the individual lowering steps between them are much, much easier to express to the point where you can sort of fairly easily express them as a domain expert rather than as a compiler expert. Um, and so this is exactly uh, what we're also using for our compiler ECO, um, which uh, well, homomorphic encryption compiler, sorry, we don't have the most <laughs> creative acronym there. And uh, in our case, this looks like this, right? So from the input program, we first go into a high level intermediate representation. And here we still have our control flow, our uh, high level operations like linear algebra operations, right? So even higher level potentially than C. This is then lowered into uh, this eventually after some optimization into scheme specific intermediate representation. And this is basically sort of representing the native operations of an FHG scheme. Most importantly, this means not having all of these convenient functions like equality, comparison, et cetera, and being sort of stuck in this multiply add, et cetera, world. And then when we want to go lower and actually target hardware, well, then we translate to the polynomial intermediate representation, which actually uh, is there to represent the underlying map of these schemes. And then there's another step, which is the RNS or residue number system intermediate representation, which is uh, representing an abstraction of how to efficiently work with large degree polynomials and large bit width polynomials in uh, sort of fixed width hardware. So um, all of these obviously are designed to uh, translate and lower down to LLVM and then inherit from that the existing targets. But we also envision that in the future, ECO will target the ISA or instruction set architecture of these upcoming DARPA D prime accelerators specifically built for FHE. I think I said the word intermediate representation a whole bunch in the last like minute or so, but let's actually look at what is an intermediate representation. Uh, and specifically, I'm saying this in the context of the MLIR compiler framework, which is what we're using to realize uh, ECO. So here, an intermediate representation is basically a description of, a, let's say, an API. You have an operation that belongs to a dialect, so standard.add. It has operands. It has results. It also has types. Very important for the actual implementation of things, but I'm going to completely ignore that for this uh, presentation. And then this basically defines the syntax, uh, in some sense, of your intermediate representation. But whether or not this actually means anything isn't defined here, right? Like we can expect that standard.add probably adds to numbers, but this actually isn't defined as part of this, it's defined through lowerings. So to give you a bit more of an interesting example, that isn't just an addition. So let's have a look at the BFB multiplication operation. So um, this is quite a bit um, less trivial than, let's say, an integer multiplication because it translates to, first of all, a series of polynomial multiplications between the polynomial elements of the ciphertext. And then actually each of these polynomial multiplications translates even further into, uh, you know, let's say, an entity or um, an element-wise multiplication and then inverse entity, which is a way of sort of performing large degree polynomial multiplications efficiently. And in fact, this will then, like, one, each one of those would actually translate even further into the RNS level IR, but that gets way too verbose for this sort of uh, overview. So um, I sort of zoomed in here a bit, so let's zoom out a bit. Um, let's have a look at what's actually happening here in terms of architecture. So um, we have a Python front end, and we also have currently a C-like sort of domain specific language front end. And we're very open to adding more front ends if people can sort of show us why they would prefer one. All of these front ends um, translate the input program into our high level intermediate representation. Uh, this is made up of our custom dialect or set of operations around FHG, but it also includes, and this is the advantage of using something like the MLIR framework, um, built in dialects and operations like the tensor or vector dialect, ones for basic arithmetic, uh, for control flow in terms of affine function calls, and all of these things that we get to inherit 
And by cleverly connecting how our, um, you know, by cleverly connecting our FHG dialect with the built-in systems, we actually get to benefit from a lot of the built-in optimizations, and we basically avoid reinventing the wheel for some of the compiler one-on-one stuff. So as I said and just showed um, uh, earlier, this then gets translated to scheme-specific IR. So for example, this bfd.mult operation that I just showed is from this bfd dialect. And then we have dialects currently for bfd, bgd, and ckks, which are the ring-based FHG schemes that will have this SIMD um, capability that I mentioned earlier. So when we then want to translate that into an actual well, computation, the easiest way would be to just uh, translate it into calls into an FHG library like SEAL, which implements all of the crypto uh, by itself. But increasingly, we're seeing that there's an interest and demand for being able to actually lower to hardware directly. And this is then when we do what we just saw, which is lower into polynomial operations. Those, and that was the thing that didn't fit on the slides, get lowered into RMS, residue number system operations. And then finally, this gets lower to LLVM if we want to target something like x86, or in the future, it would get dispatched to a deprived accelerator. Um, I've already given you an example of what it looks like to take something from, let's say, BFB through to poly, but now I want to have a bit of a closer look at the high-level transformations that I mentioned earlier. And in order to be able to do this, I, uh, we need to have a quick recap of this Sydney-like parallelism, which I already mentioned. Um, obviously, it's amazing. It allows us to do things like replace, uh, you know, many operations with a single SIMD operation, right? Great. But the catch is that it doesn't give us uh, data movement. So in normal operations like AVX512, which are very common, like server size uh, vector operations, we can actually fairly efficiently permute or scatter gather. And this is very heavily relied on in optimizations targeting this. In FHG, this is not an option. The only thing we can do in terms of data movement natively is cyclical rotation. So we can take a ciphertext and we can add significant actual runtime across rotate it uh, in a cyclical fashion. And because of this restricted um, data movement, it doesn't really work the same way as uh, computation paradigms that, like, you know, we see like AVX512 or other vectorized paradigms. And so really how to use this to get latency improvements, right? So how to accelerate a single instance of a program is very, very tricky and sometimes not very obvious. For example, this is a fairly simple program that computes um, a simple image sharpening, right? It takes a kernel and it iterates it over the image. Um, and while it may not look like it, it is actually very FHG friendly. So um, currently it's in a very unfriendly form um, because we have all of these random accesses into these uh, image pixels, uh, which is very, very bad. FHE cannot do this sort of data movement or extraction of a single element from a vector efficiently. But this does actually have an efficient FHG implementation. The problem is that it's a rather dramatic transformation. And I hope I'm not um, presuming here when I say that it's basically unrecognizable from the original program. For example, uh, this inner loop here, or this inner loop nest even, has been turned into a single instruction in the FHE program. And these outer two loops, well, they just completely disappear. Because what we're doing with the FHE approach is we're no longer iterating a kernel or an image. We're actually duplicating the image a few times, rotating it appropriately, and then jamming it through the kernel in one big SIMD operation at the end. And so um, this is an example of the kind of transformation that we need to do in order to get decent performance out of FHE. And um, it's also an example of how drastic these transformations can be. Um, so it might be natural to resolve to things like synthesis or other sort of heavyweight tools to achieve this, but our uh, goal here really was to do this with simple and efficient translation rules that you can actually use in everyday uh, development and programming. So in order to show you how Hiko would tackle something like this, I'm going to drop to a slightly smaller and simpler example that would actually fit on the slides. Uh, and that's the Hamming distance. Uh, very simple task. Calculate uh, how many positions of the vectors disagree, right? So the Hamming distance of this example is two. Um, I'm, so this is like the C++ representation of the program. Uh, this is what it would look like in the high-level intermediate representation. Um, I've omitted all the typing information here just because it gets very messy if we include that. 
So um, right now, this has a lot of these random index accesses. And as I mentioned earlier, these are very uh, bad for FEG. We can emulate them by rotation, multiplications with masks, and all these kind of things. But basically, uh, they're just prohibitively expensive. At that point, we actually show uh, it's much better to not even bother with batching and put every data item into its own ciphertext. But that's not exactly a great solution. And so what we do is we want to try and minimize these operations. Um, but before I can show you how we do that, I want to quickly unroll this program just for exposition. It makes it a lot easier to follow along. So let's give this a few unrolls. There we go. Now we have a program that does the hamming distance of size four. Maybe not the most practical program, but it fits on the slide. And it currently has a cost of uh, eight index accesses, and sorry, that should be four multiplications. And we want to make this better. And the first thing we're going to do is maybe not going to be super obvious why it's doing it, why we're doing it, but we'll get back to it later. Because the first step in what ECO does is it combines what we call sequential operations. For example, all of these additions here that we see, they keep adding to the result, right? Like it's one series of additions. Um, and we can combine these into a single big addition operation. Um, and we can obviously drop the plus zero because that's no longer relevant. And now, instead of having binary addition operations, we have n array uh, addition. And uh, this is actually quite important later on. But for now, I just hope you will believe me that will become more relevant. OK, so this is the, uh, so the next step. Uh, it's much easier to see how this relates to batching, because what we do now is we look through the operations, and we try to apply an operation instead of two individual vector elements to the entire vector. Well, that's great. We can get rid of all the other ones because they're essentially being pre-computed by this operation. But the catch is that, well, now what we need to do is we need to add an index access every time we use this result, right? So instead of actually removing index accesses, we merely move them around in the program. The good news is that if you do this uh, replacement in a, let's say, um, clever way, and you continue doing it, for example, doing it to the multiply here, then we're starting to see the first improvements, right? Now we only have four index accesses rather than eight that we had in the beginning. Uh, and we've also removed three out of four multiplies. Um, in practice, um, in like reverse programs, it takes a bit more than just hand waving to make this always work. And so in the compiler, we actually have a good amount of what we call target slot logic, which decides how and where to vectorize these things uh, so that this works out in as many cases as possible. OK, so what have we done? We've made the program, I guess, not just 50, but actually more than 50% faster. That's really nice. And in the world of like Clang, that would be um, like a best paper award, whatever. But in the world of FHE, that's just not even table stakes. 50% faster is nowhere near sufficient in a world where the performance gap between naive and expert is many orders of magnitudes in the worst case. And so um, I promised you we'd get back to this interesting um, addition operation, and that's what we're going to do now. First of all, we need to translate these index accesses here into rotations. So that means that we now, instead of fully emulating that this is a scalar, we're just moving the, the value that we want to be on the same slot in each of the uh, cyberdecks that we have. So that um, rotations obviously are a part of why an index access is so expensive, but they're still cheaper than fully emulating an index access. Um, and then um, we can get rid of the last index access in this program by just saying, look, if we're trying to return a scalar, well, just look into the first slot or the zeroth slot of your ciphertext. And that gets us to a program that now has uh, no more index accesses, a single multiply, if you rotate. This is much, much, much faster than the input program was. But most importantly, it's still linear. It's still O of N in the um, size of the input. And we can actually do significantly better here. And that's by exploiting that all of these inputs here have the same origin, right? So all the things being added have the same, um, they originate from the same uh, ciphertext, they're just different rotations of the same ciphertext. And here we are the first, as far as I know, to exploit, automate, and sort of generic by uh, this FHG folklore technique that is used to compute the sum of uh, elements in a ciphertext. And the way we do this is fairly straightforward. We take a copy of the ciphertext, we rotate it by half, 
we add them back together to get the partial sum, and then we rinse and repeat this like a logarithmic number of steps until we have the sum in every slot. And obviously, in the concrete example here, well, we went from three rotations to two rotations because at size four, the difference isn't significant. But you can, I think, clearly see how for larger sizes, and in FHG, we're talking 8,000 to 64K um, elements per cyclotext going from O of N to O of log N can make a significant difference in runtime. And I will have some evaluation results on this later. OK, so this is sort of a toy walkthrough of what HECO does in terms of compilation. When we zoom out a bit, um, the compilation pipeline looks like this. We take in an AST uh, for the program from the front end. We then convert it into the SSA high-level intermediate representation. SSA here being single static assignment. It basically means we don't have variables that are overwritten again. It's a very standard form for compilers and makes it much easier to write optimizations. Um, we also then apply a bunch of standard out-of-the-box simplifications constant folding, common sub-expression elimination, sort of standard techniques that just help us uh, get the problem size down a bit. Then we do what we call type separation, where we split the sort of vectors and tensors that appear in the program into the ones that are irrelevant because they're operating on plain text and stuff, and the ones that we actually care about that operate on secret values. And that allows us to then do all of our optimizations only on the things that we should actually be optimizing. Because uh, it would not be good to apply FHE style optimizations to standard sort of plain text number crunching. Um, after this, we do another round of simplifications. And then we do the vectorization part, which is what I spent most of my time just uh, sort of walking you through. Because the vectorization part could unlock uh, more redundancies, we do another set of simplification before then finally doing this ciphertext folding pass, which exploits this folklore technique that I just showed you. And then from there, um, if we're sort of continuing this train, uh, we go to the scheme-specific intermediate representation, and that would be the point where we do what's called noise management, which is inserting cyclotext maintenance operations and all these other sort of um, slightly more technical and crypto-related aspects of the compilation. Okay, so that's what HECO does. Uh, well, how does it do? Well, if we look at some uh, actual evaluation results of the optimization, uh, we can see that when we compare heat code solutions against naive non batch solutions, we see about an order of magnitude speed up. Uh, so that's a log axis, right? And we see that uh, in pretty much all of the cases, we get at least an order of magnitude speed up. Um, and that's great in itself, I think, as a result. But in order to show that we're not just sort of doing some speed up, but that we're actually finding sort of what the experts would have written, uh, we're also comparing, where possible, to a tool called Porcupine. So Porcupine is also an FHG compiler, but it's a synthesis-based tool. So it really only works for sort of toy sizes, and it takes even then up to like 20 plus minutes, and sometimes just absolutely fails. But when we could evaluate it, we could show that HECO and Porcupine actually produce essentially the same output. There are some situations where Porcupine is ever so slightly better than our tool, but it's basically within the uh, margin of error on this kind of uh, scale. And so what we're showing with HECO is that you can, in fact, achieve near expert batching solutions for a lot of different programs um, the same way that these synthesis-based tools have been doing it, but actually do it in less than a second of compile time, making it actual practical to give it to non-expert developers and ask them to integrate this tool into their sort of um, you know, co um, develop, uh, compile, debug cycle, because obviously you cannot go wait for a 20 minute synthesis compilation every time you want to do something. Of course, HECO also scales to more real world example sizes. And in the paper, uh, which is currently on the submission, but we have a preprint up on archive, uh, you can see more about how HECO scales to an actual larger sort of real world size problem instances. This is me nearly finished, but I want to do one quick diversion before I conclude which is that um, I want to briefly talk about FHE standardization. Um, and so maybe not in the way you're thinking about, which is the scheme standardization. Um, this is actually going amazingly well. Um, for several years now, we've had a great de facto community standard, which specifies sort of what levels of security are considered acceptable, what parameter sets are considered safe, and so on. And um, as a result of this being very, very stable over the last few years, this is now being turned into an official ISO standard, 
and it's being driven by uh, Microsoft and Intel primarily right now, but obviously as an ISO standard has a huge community around it now working on it. And I'm very optimistic that, you know, within the sometimes glacial pace of an ISO program, <laughs> program, this will come out fairly soon, and then we'll actually have a very fixed and nice description of all the standard schemes. What we don't currently have, and what I obviously as a compiler person care about much more, is standardization in terms of intermediate representations. Uh, we did have this draft API that came out around the same time as the original community standard for the schemes, but I think it was just a bit too early at that point. Um, so what we ended up with instead is like just a de facto conceptual API. For example, SEAL has an evaluator object that then offers add, multiply, et cetera functions corresponding to the scheme operations. And pretty much all the other uh, libraries follow a similar pattern. Um, the problem is that, well, first of all, they're different, but that's just an engineering question. But also, conceptually, it's not quite sufficient to really think about and argue about. Um, so, you know, this is just one layer in ECO, whereas, you know, all the other layers don't really have an obvious standard of uh, representation. And so now that compiler efforts are accelerating, and I don't just mean our compiler, but there's also um, the transpiler by Google, Zama has an internal compiler, and there's various other parties and stakeholders actively building compilers for FHE, I believe it's high time to revisit the standardization and expand it beyond just this one level. And so we actually have um, um, a roundtable, an, an informal roundtable on unifying FHE abstractions that I'm moderating. We meet roughly monthly, and it includes stakeholders uh, from Intel, Microsoft, Google, Zama, and a variety of other people and companies working on FHE compilers. And so if you happen to be watching this and are interested in this area, please reach out to us or to me um, because we'd love to talk and hear your ideas, even if you're not necessarily working on FHE compilers, but maybe also on other kinds of advanced cryptography compilers like zero knowledge groups or MPC. Okay, now it's my actual final slides. I just want to uh, refer back, back to the paper once more and also mention that you can actually find HECO in a more or less ready to run state on our GitHub at github.com slash marvelhe slash hico. One caveat, currently you need to go to the dev branch, not the main branch, in order to find the company. Thank you.